Would you look with me now in 1 Corinthians chapter 4? Uh, This is our every member commitment season, so I wanted to come back to where we have been as a thematic focus for the last two years, and that is um, lifestyle stewardship, found faithful. And this is our basic text. This is how one should regard us, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, It is required of stewards that they be found faithful. The grass withers, the flower fades, the word of our God abides forever. By His grace and by His mercy, may His word be preached for you. Please be seated. Would you do me a favor, please, and would you take that card out, that every member commitment card, and I want you to have it in front of you just for the next couple of minutes. And then you can set it to the side until we make our commitments at the end of the service. But I want you to hold it in front of you. Uh, I will confess to you, one of the, um, there were a couple of rather daunting things that 21 plus years ago, uh, when God called me to Briarwood uh, to be the, uh, have the privilege of being the senior pastor, there were a, a couple of things that were very daunting to me, uh, a, a number of them. I won't tell you all of them, but I will tell you one of them was the every member commitment season, coupled with the fact that um, we had a budget that was 50% devoted to sending the resources of Briarwood out for evangelism and missions and mercy and benevolences. That was rather daunting. Now, you know, back at Christ Covenant, we were doing 33%, and that was daunting, and now stepping up 50%. And uh, so this is going to have to up my heart game, my soul game pretty quick. And uh, so it was, a, but then I have just grown to love both of them. Do y'all realize this last year and this coming year, we are right now involved in planting 36 churches? 36 churches, nine nationally, and um, what's nine from 36? (laughs) Somebody, Cindy, help. Uh, (laughs) What do you think I paid for that math degree? Help, help. But anyway, that's um, that's where that's. uh, And then I could go way beyond that, and that our deacons receive your information this week and next week that allows them to put that budget together under the oversight of the session, approved by the session, and then brought back to you in December. But they work off of this information. But more than that practical thing that we can be faithful to what God has called us to. I, um, I have grown to love this season. I've grown to love it because of what stewardship has meant to my life personally, and, um, and then what it has meant um, as I've watched it at work in the lives of God's people. I've come to some convictions about this, but let me just also mention to you that um, we have embraced stewardship as a, you know, we do a ministry theme every year to try to help our preaching and our congregational communities and provide something to weave into the discipleship of small groups. And, um, and so we'd started that just a little bit over uh, two years ago in January, two years ago, and um, almost two years ago, January. And um, well, I got started on the series, and, um, and as I did the series, I took it up to missions conference, and then we put it on hold, and then we had missions conference, and I was going to pick it back up after missions conference, and then guess what? Uh, COVID-19. And so I have been laboring, I'm sure with varying degrees of success and failure, I have been laboring to be a part of our sessions, pastoring this congregation through this season, warding off um, uh, political uh, um, political uh, efforts to gauge everything, or sociological efforts, and trying to think biblically and theolo- theologically as to how do you deal with the dynamics of life and the exigencies of life in a fallen world, particularly in light of this. <clears throat> um, so, therefore, I wasn't able to get back to that series. 
And uh, so um, then that meant that this year we decided, well, let's just keep on with the series, hoping that we can get back to it. And, um, and then, of course, I started the series on Romans in light uh, because I, we're stewards of the gospel. And so I started the series on Romans. Well, I, I want, today I want to make something, kind of a little bit of announcement for this coming year about how lifestyle stewardship is moving into this coming year with a very specific focus. If you can remember two years ago when I preached this series, I said, um, I want you to think of stewardship in three areas as a Christian. Number one, think of stewardship in the area of your responsibilities in life. How do you, how do you, um, how are you a good steward of your responsibilities in life? Secondly, for instance, I'm a pastor. I will answer before God for my calling as a pastor uh, and as a husband of Cindy. And uh, so I have responsibilities in life I'm called to steward as Christ's servant. Secondly, uh, the second area I ask you to remember was not only responsibilities, but relationships. You steward relationships. Um, with one another, with the lost, with your family. You steward your relationships. And then thirdly, you steward your resources. Now, what has happened throughout the ages, and I'm not going to buck the trend, is that resources, for the sake of analysis in the church, have now for many years been broken down into three areas themselves. The, your resources of time your resources of your talents, and your resources of your treasures. Time and talents and treasures. So th those are helpful. So my overall is I want you to steward your responsibilities, your relationships, and your resources. One, in the area of resources, we can divide that up into three areas. Time. That's something that every day you and I have the same amount of. We don't all have the same amount of talents. We don't all have the same amount of treasure, but we do all have the same amount of talents. How do I steward my time? And you'll notice there's a place for you to start thinking through that on the card, the stewardship of time. Then how do I steward my talents? Now, stop here, please. Quit coloring in the zeros. Hang up the phone, okay? Get this, please. Get this, we, this is where we're going to park next year, the stewardship of talents. You have two types of talents. You have talents that come by way of creation, uh, your mental abilities. Some of you are great working with your hands. You have talents, physical, mental talents that come by way of creation. Secondly, you have talent, you have a spiritual talent. You just confessed it up there. Each one of you have a gift of God's varied grace. You have a spiritual gift. So next year, we want to focus on spiritual gifts. I'm calling it 3D body life. 3D body life. We all are members of the body of Christ. Each one of us have a gift. Every gift is important. And that's next year. 3D. Discovering your gift, developing your gift, and deploying your gift. And we're going to focus in on the spiritual gifts Praise God for your physical, mental talents and everything, but it's your spiritual gifts that will direct the use of those physical talents. And each one of you have that gift. So I'm going to this, starting in January, we're going to take some time between January and the missions conference, and we'll try it again between January and the missions conference, and we're going to look at some key texts of Scripture. We're going to Matthew. Do you remember the parable of the talents? We're going to go there. Do you remember? We're going to go to Luke. Do you remember the, tele, the parable of the minus? The mina? In fact, there's your first day. Between now and January, find out what a mina is, okay? And we're going to look at the parable of the minus. Then we're going to look at four very important 
text of Scripture. This will be easy. Ephesians 4 and 1 Peter 4. Ephesians 4 and 1 Peter 4. And 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans 12. See that? 4 and 12, you can remember it that way, right? So those are the key texts on spiritual gifts. And so that we can be good stewards of our gifts. There's a little place on your card for you to start thinking through it. I'm in a ministry using my spiritual gift right now. And you can check that. Or I'd like to know more about it. I'm glad you'd like to know more about it because I'm going to preach on it next year. So we're going to, how do I discover, develop, and deploy? Can I tell you something else? Now, this this is, this is, here is inside baseball. (laughs) One, I... I want every one of us, I want the body of Christ manifested at Briarwood to function with every member in their place that God has called and gifted them to be. And we want to create pathways for you to get there and help you uh, get there. That means, you see, here's my back door inside bay. That means we have to up the game, our game on discipleship. Because it's through discipleship that you discover, develop, and deploy. And if we up our game on discipleship, we'll also have to up our game in small group discipleship. And that will all have to work together. Okay, so thanks for letting me share that with you. But now I want you to come back to why I love stewardship season and why more than the practical thing for the deacon so that we can use our resources wide. But I love for you to have this and I'm looking forward to the stewardship emphasis in the coming year as we continue because, get this, there, to me, there is nothing more insightful, more reliable, more practical, more helpful in the Christian life than the biblical doctrine of stewardship. The biblical doctrine of stewardship will reveal to you where you are in your relationship with Christ. There is nothing more helpful. There is nothing more insightful. There is nothing more practical than to understand and embrace and engage in the biblical doctrine of, of, event, uh, of stewardship it be, it because our stewardship reveals our embrace of the gospel. Let me just go ahead and tell you up front. It is the gospel that creates stewards. And if you understand and embrace the gospel, you can't help but grow in stewardship. The two are inseparably. That's why stewardship is so helpful, seeing where I am with the gospel. Where am I in my allegiance to Christ? Where am I in my affections? Are my allegiance and affections to myself in this world or to Christ and His kingdom? Stewardship is that wonderful snapshot, that wonderful insight, and an amazing tool to help me grow in dying to self and living to Christ through the gospel. Its metrics are gloriously, you know, the Bible says examine yourself to see whether you be of the faith. I know no better metric than Christian stewardship to examine myself to see where I am in my relationship to the gospel, in my relationship to Christ, in my relationship to his people. That gospel is glorious. I know you don't remember this, but I first introduced my heart on this, uh, I think it was 18 years ago. I did a series of sermons called The Five Ships of the Christian Armada. The five ships of the Christian armada, worship, leadership, fellowship, discipleship, and stewardship. And we followed up two years ago with lifestyle stewardship from this text of Scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, where it gives us an insight into the calling we have as stewards. 
Would you go back there with me? I know you remember my sermon in great detail from two years ago, but just in case you forgot one little aspect of it, I'm not going to preach it all again, but I want you to go back to this text with me just for a moment. Look at that 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 1. This is how one should regard us. In other words, he says, how do I want the world to see me? Servants of Christ. Can I go ahead and tell you why? Because he's also going to say, because Christ is my life. Now, folks, can I just do a little side deal here? Notice Paul doesn't say, I want people to regard me as a saved terrorist. I don't want people to regard me as a self-centered Pharisee who's now a Christian. He doesn't want to be known by his sins. So enough of this hyphenating our life with our sin life before we came to Christ. Why? As God has has graciously shown me my sins in my life in Christ, I can't remember a single time when he convicted me of sins that I later wanted to be named by him. So we get, we want to mortify sins and we want to not even, not only not be named by them, we don't want them to name us. Notice also, now please understand this. Hopefully you know how much I am appreciative of what God has done for this nation and my heart for this nation. I've preached on it and preached on it. But notice Paul doesn't identify himself as a Jewish Christian. He identifies himself as a Christian. And when you look at me, here's what I want you to see. A doulos, a bond slave of Christ. Out of love to Christ, I am a, here's our calling. We are servants of Christ. We praise God we're also saints We praise God that we're also gifted. (laughs) We praise God for all of the things that come through the blessings of the gospel. But here's how we want people to regard us. We are servants of Christ. Secondly, secondly, he not only says he is a servant of Christ, but secondly, he says, here is my vocation as a servant. They regard us as servants of Christ and stewards. Now, particularly as an apostle, he had been entrusted with divine revelation. But for all of us, we, we're not apostles. None, nobody here is an apostle in, in terms of a capital A apostle. None of us here are capital A apostles. But like the apostles had a spiritual gift and calling, so we have a spiritual gift. Therefore, we are what? servants of Christ, and we are stewards of whatever God has entrusted to us, our responsibilities, our relationships, our resources, in our resources, our time, our talents, and our treasure, that we are stewards. Now, what is the metric for effective stewardship? Keep reading. Moreover, it is not suggested, here's your objective, as a servant identified of Christ, calling as a steward of your spiritual gifts, responsibilities, relationships, and resources, it is required of us to be what? What's the next word? Found faithful. Who finds us? Jesus. When does he find us? Well, every day, obviously. But this is anticipating the day of stewardship judgment. When I have to give an account, what is it I want to hear? This isn't hard. You have said it many times in many cases. When he, you see him as a Christian who served Christ and you were not perfect. Is anyone, i tell you what, I'm going to give you a chance. Anyone here perfect? As a Christian, you can may stand up, and that will be your first known imperfection. (laughs) No, we're sinners saved by grace. We're wanting to sin less. 
our, we know we will never be perfect experientially. We are perfect legally through the blood and righteousness of Christ. But we will never be perfect experientially. So what is it when we get here, get there, we long for the judge who is our Savior to say, faithful. You know the phrase, don't you? Well done, good and faithful servant. Let me ask you a question. If you were to, if you were to walk around, uh, if you were to walk around the school where your children were, or now your grandchildren, and you heard them talking in the playground, and one of them said, well, what do you think about your, what, what do you think about your dad? How would you love to hear your child say, ah, he, yeah, he's mediocre. Yeah, he's passable. Uh, my dad, yeah, he gets by. No, we don't want to hear that. And when we get to meet Jesus, we're not going to hear perfect. But we can hear, well done, good and faithful servant of Christ. And what were you faithful in? Stewardship. You were found in that day to have been faithful from this day. That's where we are. Now, what motivates us to be faithful? It's simply this, the love of Christ, that we love Him. Now, will we ever be perfect? No. We're going to take some time and some parables. But I do need to put a warning here. We're going to take some time and some parables to learn about stewardship. And I look forward to it. I'm so excited about it. I can't hardly stand it. I've been studying, looking forward to this series and thinking about how they can be downloaded into small groups and small group leaders can really help us in this and the communities. But uh, as I've been thinking through it and working through it, there's one thing that stands out to me. In the parable of the talents, the person that was not a steward now, there were different success, different levels of success, different level of outcome. But those who were good and faithful had an outcome. Those who didn't have an outcome, in that case, revealed their, steward, their lack of stewardship did not cause them to have a lost soul. It revealed that they were lost and they were cast away into the fiery furnace. Stewardship is a metric, and the measurement of a metric of stewardship is to be found faithful in your responsibilities, in your relationships, in your resources, time, talents, and treasure. Why? Because you love Him. That's why. That's the motivation, because Christ is your life, and in Him is your life. So how do we see ourselves? We are servants of Christ. What is our calling? We are stewards. What is our objective? To be found faithful in Christ. When Christ returns and we appear, our stewardship will reveal We love Him, we know Him who first loved us, and the metric we long to hear in that day is to be found faithful. Harry, I as a Christian have not been faithful as a steward. Then let's start today. Because stewardship as an element of discipleship is something of growing grace and growing in grace. So let's start today. My first couple of years... I made it my objective to catch up with Cindy in the Christian life. My last couple of years, I'm still on the objective to catch up with Cindy in my Christian life. But one of the things I first noted about her was in the area of time and talents and treasure that I came later to understand those those divisions and categories, I noticed there was something there. And then I had a spiritual father named Harold Jones, and I'd never met a man who sought to be faithful to Christ more than that man. I watched my grandfather in this matter of wanting to be faithful 
as a steward and constantly thinking like that. Well, in my effort to catch up with Cindy, I knew that good Christians, this is about my second year of being a Christian, I knew good Christians that I met all had a life first. Did y'all know that? So all good Christians have got a life first, I think. At least it seemed like to me. They all had a life first. So I, um, I figured, I don't know whether Cindy's got a life verse or not, but if she doesn't, I can beat her. I'll get one. And if she does, I'll get a better one. So I, I'll never forget this. So we're in Greenville, North Carolina. I found my life verse, Matthew six thirty three. Seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Okay? So I went in, I said to her, oh, <laughs> it was an afternoon, I just got back from class, and I couldn't wait to tell her. I said, hey, um, I was going to do it at family devotions, but I said, no, I'm going to do it right now. I said, um, hey, I've got a life verse. Do you have one? She said, yeah. I said, okay, well, I didn't beat her. I said, uh, I bet my life verse is better than your life verse. And she said, well, what is your life verse? I said, I'm, I'm going to tell you. It's Matthew 6, and I also have it memorized. It's nice to memorize your life verse. <laughs> uh, Seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. She said, that is a great verse. And I said, well, what is yours? And she opened up her Bible. Matthew six thirty three, And again, I didn't beat her. And I didn't have a better verse because she had the same verse. <laughs> and the very same verse. I said, you know what? We got the same life verse. Have you ever thought, let's get married again? I mean, this is, this is God's stamp on our marriage, isn't it? But here's, then I went back and I looked at the context. And folks, this is, please get this. The context, Matthew 6, is in the middle of what we call the Sermon on the Mount, which is the constitution of the kingdom of God at work in this world. It's the king sitting down on the mountain, now not Moses, now Jesus, one greater than Moses, giving us the kingdom lifestyle. And as he gives us the kingdom lifestyle, and as he develops it, in Matthew chapter 6, he gets to this section, and he says this, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth destroys, where rust corrupts, where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves, what? Treasures in heaven. Then, four verses later, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. And then I realized this is a better life first than I thought it was. <laughs> because how are we living when we're saved? We're living for ourselves. The key phrase, listen, I understand there's a place for a savings account, an IRS. I understand the, that's not what it's saying. It, the key is don't lay up for yourselves treasures. Don't live earthly minded. Live kingdom minded. The kingdom of heaven. That's the way you live. Seek first things. God will secure them in your life as you live responsibly as a steward. But your savings account better not be laying up for yourself treasures. Can I give you another thing I love about the church I have the privilege to pastor? Almost every year that I've been here, God has through you given beyond our budget. And our budget includes a renovation, uh, you know, fund and this. And that's just, that's just being wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Uh, but, but when we get to the end of the year and there's any giving that's over, then that diaconal committee under the oversight of the elders 
sets those funds aside, and then goes to all the ministry leadership teams and says, tell us how you would like to use those funds for an outreach so that we actually get way beyond 50%. How do we use those funds for an outreach event through your ministry? And y'all bring them, we'll evaluate them. Some of you will get it, some of you won't, but that's what we'll do at the end of the year. And you got to say, isn't, this isn't, we're just going to give money and divide it up. No, the resources got up. You know what's behind that? Here's what's behind that. Our elders and deacons believe that you gave this year out of love to Christ to extend the kingdom. So you exercise stewardship. Now, if he gave beyond what we anticipated, now what do we need to do? We need to put it to work. We are not a savings and loan. Let's get it to work. Let's put it to the work of the kingdom. And so that's what God has called us to do, and that's what they attempt to do at a moment like that. So, in other words, we don't pile up resources for Briarwood. Briarwood is an embassy of the kingdom of God to equip and send God's people into the world and their resources that they bring in worship and praise to God throughout the world. Now, we're, we're never perfect on this, but that's what's guiding that concept and that thought. And, that, and that, that you can't get there as a church unless you're there as the members of the church, that we think that way. Have y'all ever seen the bumper sticker on the RV of a retired person? The bumper sticker, being of sound mind, I spent it all. And I thought that was pretty funny. You obviously don't. <laughs> but let me tell you what's on the, on the bumper of a Christian. Being of sound mind, I'm giving it all. I am not laying up things for myself. When I get to the end, I don't want the government sending my resources, my God-given resources. I want to have prayerfully made sure that my resources, the time He gives me here while life endures, the talents He gives me, my spiritual gifts that He gives me, and the resources He gives me, I want to make sure it's being used for the kingdom. So let me give you a couple of takeaways. First takeaway is what I call the maximization takeaway. This is, this is what I believe is the, the very first one. Ultimately, ultimately, here, here's how you maximize stewardship. Make it a matter of gospel discipleship. The maximization of stewardship in your life is to make stewardship your lifestyle response of being discipled by the gospel of Jesus. That's why I just said, we can't do things on stewardship of time, talents, and treasure without gospel discipleship, because it's not intuitive. What's intuitive is laying it up for myself. I have to have a transformed mind through discipleship for this to take place. Therefore, we, we in stewardship need this lifestyle response, and that maximizes everything. Harry, how does the gospel maximize my stewardship? Because here's the gospel. You are not your own. <laughs> well, how can I lay it up for me when me isn't even here? I'm laid up for Jesus. You are not your own, but you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Or, I am what I am by the grace of God. Or, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. The gospel, the gospel brings me to the denial of self. Therefore, the resources of life can't be laid up for myself because I've died to myself to live unto Christ. Thus, the resources are from Christ to me that I might be found faithful in their right use for Christ. Secondly, second takeaway is the principle, that's the principle of maxim, maximization. I don't even know if that's a word, but I really like it, maximization. Then the principle of maturation. What is the principle of maturation? 
Use the God-given helps He has in His Word to help you grow in discipleship. For instance, in the discipleship of time, did you know God gave you a gift to help you? It's called the Sabbath. If you can get that day right, it will, ma- it will, max- it will mature you how you do the other days for Him. The Lord's Day. If you make it a delight, you ride the heavens of the earth. You ride upon the, upon, the, upon the winds around the earth that you soar like an eagle when you embrace uh, the, your time using it for the Lord. So learn the principle of using the Sabbath. And here's what I'm, tra- I'm trying to give you some training wheels in, in gospel stewardship. Training wheels for your time, Lord's Day. That's not the end of your stewardship of time, but it's a God-given gift to get you started. It's training wheels for all the other days. Secondly, let me give you another, another one. For your talents, ask yourself, where is my joy? When you learn that your physical and spiritual talents are resources to be used for Christ, you know what's going to happen in your life? Joy, like never before. You, You know what you're going to find out? When you use your talents for Jesus, instead of emptiness of unmet expectations after they're used, there will be joy. You'll find out it's more blessed to give than to receive. Let me give you a third one. What about my treasure? Let me give you some training wheels. It's called the tithe. The tithe are training wheels. The tithe has been given to help get you started in stewardship. It's not the end, but it's the beginning. It's the tithe. That's what God, that's, that's what, um, that's what God has given as training wheels to help you. Do not rob God. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, the place of praise and worship, whereby God sends the gospel around the world. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Don't rob God. Don't rob Peter to pay Paul, and don't rob, uh, don't rob God to pay Peter and Paul. That you bring the whole tithe, and then the offerings, like a faith promise offering, world missions, or like a uh, or like a, um, a alms offering after a Lord after the Lord's Supper. Those are all um, a, those are all aids, divinely given aids to get you started and help you in the development of your stewardship. Thirdly, don't embrace minimalization. Maxim- maximization make it go- a gospel response. I'm not my own. I've been bought with a price. Maturation, make use of the divine elements He's put in place. The tithe, uh, the Lord's Day, the use of spiritual gifts in a ministry that begins to build your joy. But number three, avoid minimalization. Harry, what is minimalization? Here's what it is very simply. Minimalization is when you think stewardship stops at the tithe. The tithe is there to teach you it all belongs to Him. The tithe is your method of telling God it all belongs to Him. Don't, 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 well, I gave the Lord the Lord's day. In, in some cases, I gave the Lord an hour on the Lord's day. Don't, don't embrace minimalization. My friend Alistair Begg, Begg calls it the, the uh, 90-10 rule. I give God 10%, the rest of the other 90% is mine. No, no. None of it's mine. Those are just assets to get me started so that everything is His. All belongs to Him. I surrender. You've sung it, haven't you? All. Well, folks, listen to me, please. We don't surrender all until you are all surrendered. The surrendering of all never happens until we have surrendered. So if you're here today and you've never surrendered to Christ, I'd like to invite you to Him. (laughs) What a great life. Now you got everything for a use that counts for eternity. Now you 
will count for eternity as well live eternally with him. And thanks be to God that he has given us these gifts. So to him, we surrender all. May I ask you to take your card and would you just uh, hold it? Uh, you may want to be um, editing it, but for these next few moment, moments, would you hold it? Would you place it in your hands and prayerfully do what we sung before the Word of God was preached. Take, Lord, here's my time, talents, and treasure. I'm about to pointedly give it with dependence upon your grace. But right now, I surrender, not simply this statement of my time, talents, and treasure. Not simply my tithe or the Lord's day. I surrender all because I surrender me.